So before I get to work, uh, I'm going to put you all to work. And uh, you don't have to worry, it's nothing too strenuous, but uh, to start with, I wanted to ask for a, a show of hands. Uh, who here remembers the October 2017 ambush in Niger uh, by members of the Islamic State that killed uh, four U.S. soldiers? Okay, it's uh, very good to know. And uh, another question, and I'm going to ask you to uh, be honest. Uh, which of you first became uh, aware of U.S. military uh, operations in Africa as a result of, of that ambush and the resulting fallout? Okay, some of you here. Well, uh, I'm here to say that, uh, that you're not alone. Uh, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham and, uh, and Democratic Senate Leader Chuck Schumer uh, both said that they had been unaware of the large U.S. presence in Niger in the wake of that attack. And to be clear, uh, Lindsey Graham is uh, a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So, you know, I'm guessing that uh, that none of you are members of that uh, esteemed body. So, uh, so if you didn't know about the U.S. presence there, uh, you have uh, nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, and, and on top of that, it's really not your fault. Uh, that's the way that, uh, that U.S. Africa Command, uh, which is the geographic combatant command that oversees U.S. military operations on the African continent, you know, that's how they want it. You know, for, more than, uh, for more than a decade now, AFRICOM, as it's better known, has, uh, has worked hard to keep uh, U.S. military efforts on the continent uh, hidden in the shadows. And for a significant amount of time, uh, I've been working to try and, uh, and shine a light in those corners so that, uh, that you have a chance to know, you know what your tax uh, dollars are, are being used for. And, uh, and so you aren't shocked when American troops are killed in a country that, uh, unfortunately, most Americans can't locate on a map. So the ambush in Niger is uh, it's instructive if you want to gain an understanding of just what uh, U.S. troops do in Africa. So that's where I'm going to start. Now, if you ask uh, AFRICOM what they're up to in Africa, they're apt to talk about uh, humanitarian efforts. You know, from, from what they publicly disclose uh, about all that you think that they do is conduct uh, informational seminars and they dig wells, water wells, and, uh, and carry out uh, innocuous training exercises. But uh, that isn't what U.S. troops were doing in Niger in October 2017. You know, just after the ambush, AFRICOM said that uh, the American troops that were killed were providing uh, advice and assistance, and that's a quote, to, uh, to local counterparts. Uh, but later it would become clear that those troops, uh, an 11-man unit known as uh, Operational Detachment Alpha Team 3212, uh, were working out of the town of Ulam uh, with a large Nigerian force under the umbrella of Operation Juniper Shield, which is a wide-ranging and uh, a long-running counterterrorism effort in Northwest Africa. Now, Team 3212 was actually supposed to lend support to another group of American commandos who were trying to uh, capture or kill an Islamic State leader uh, as part of a completely separate, and I might add uh, ominously codenamed, Operation known as Obsidian Nomad 2. But what began as a, uh, a low-risk patrol with little chance of encountering the uh, enemy turned into a mission where they were supposed to uh, provide backup for an elite assault team. Uh, but then uh, bad weather intervened. It grounded the helicopters of the commandos from Obsidian Nomad 2, and Team 3212 had to go it alone. And, uh, and it went poorly for them. Uh, the, that team didn't find uh, any militants, but the, uh, the militants found them. They were short on water, so they stopped in a village called Tongo Tongo to, uh, to resupply. And barely 200 yards uh, outside of that village, 
their convoy came under heavy and sustained gunfire. So they were outnumbered and they were outgunned and in the end, four of them, Staff Sergeant Brian Black, Staff Sergeant Dustin Wright, Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Johnson, and Sergeant uh, LeDavid Johnson uh, were all killed in what was and uh, what still is uh, the largest American combat loss in Africa since the, uh, the 1993 Black Hawk Down incident. Uh, you know, I might add that, uh, that the man who reportedly coordinated uh, the ambush is still at large, uh, and the State Department just issued a wanted poster for him and offered a $5 million reward for uh, information about him. Now, uh, this attack was a, it's a great, great shock to most Americans, uh, including, as I mentioned, members of Congress. But it's really only because America had been very lucky in the years before the ambush and because the, uh, the U.S. military is just so secretive. Uh, combat in Niger was not some sort of uh, one-off event. Between 2013 and 2017, uh, U.S. Special Operations Forces saw combat in at least 13 African countries. In addition to uh, Niger, we're talking about Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, Libya, Mali, Mauritania, Somalia, South Sudan, and Tunisia. I'll take a moment to digest that. And, uh, and the casualties in Niger were, uh, they were no one-off event either. Uh, U.S. troops had been killed or wounded in action in at least five other countries, including Kenya, Libya, Somalia, South Sudan, and Tunisia. You know, just this month, uh, Somali militants from the, uh, from the terror group Al-Shabaab attacked the U.S. base at, uh, at Balidogal, Somalia. And uh, one of the Americans there was injured in that attack. So these incidents uh, tend to happen more than you think. Now, this is all to say that, uh, that Juniper Shield and Obsidian Nomad, uh, those two operations that were running simultaneously in Niger, uh, were not isolated efforts, uh, but they were part of a, uh, a panoply of named military operations and activities uh, that U.S. forces have been conducting from dozens of bases that are located, uh, they're scattered all across the northern tier of Africa. In all, there are uh, 36 operations and activities that are currently ongoing, or at least they were until recently. And you can read all the names up here. Uh, this is more uh, named efforts than anywhere else in the world. It's actually far more uh, than are going on in the Middle East right now, where America is still at war in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, despite what the president might think, uh, Syria, and uh, in a manner of speaking, Yemen. So. You know, while there are more troops uh, deployed to and engaged in combat in the greater Middle East, the, uh, the sheer number of named efforts in Africa thoroughly surpasses uh, even that war-torn region. You know, it's, it's not important, and I'd run out of time if I uh, tried to run through all these code names, but uh, I wanted to mention a few of them because I think they'll, they'll give you an idea, at least a quick overview, of the types of missions that are uh, being carried out on the continent, and, uh, and the overlap among many of them. There's uh, Juniper Nimbus, which is up here. It's, it's uh, a long-running operation that's aimed at supporting the Nigerian military campaign against the terror group uh, Boko Haram. There's one called uh, Nimble Shield, which is a low-profile effort also targeting Boko Haram as well as what the U.S. military calls ISIS West Africa. There's Armada Sweep. Uh, that's a U.S. Uh, Navy electronic surveillance effort. Uh, it's conducted from ships off the coast of East Africa, and that particular operation is uh, integral to the U.S. drone war in the region. There's Echo Casemate, which covers a series of uh, activities in the Central African Republic, 
uh, in support of French and, uh, and allied African forces that are operating there. There's Junction Rain. That's a maritime security effort in the Gulf of Guinea. So we're talking about West Africa. And that actually involves uh, African navies and, uh, and U.S. Coast Guard boarding teams. So uh, the U.S. Coast Guard doesn't just guard the U.S. coast, they're also active overseas. There's Rainmaker, which is a highly sensitive classified uh, signals intelligence effort that, uh, that I'm told that uh, the public wasn't supposed to know about, but that information was disclosed to me by AFRICOM. So, uh, make of that what you will and keep it under your hat if you like. <laughs> There's uh, Exile Hunter, in which uh, elite U.S. troops trained and equipped an Ethiopian force for counterterrorism missions in Somalia. There's one called Kodiak Hunter, which is a program in which U.S. Special Operations Forces trained and equipped a Kenyan force to conduct counterterrorism missions in Somalia. There's also Mongoose Hunter, which is a program in which U.S. Special Operations Forces trained and equipped a Somali force for counterterrorism missions in Somalia. Uh, there is uh, Ultimate Hunter, which is uh, a program in which U.S. Special Operations Forces trained and equipped a Ugandan force for, does anyone have a guess? It's uh, counterterrorism missions in Somalia. So, the last efforts that I mentioned, all the, uh, the hunter operations, they're all conducted uh, specifically by U.S. Navy SEALs. And uh, what they're all known for in, in U.S. military parlance is uh, they're, they're all known as uh, 127 ECHO programs. And these can be run by uh, uh, Joint Special Operations Command, also known as JSOC. And that's the uh, very secretive organization that controls the uh, Navy SEAL Team 6. That's the team that uh, killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, the Army's Delta Force operators and other uh, extremely elite special mission units. Uh, the programs can also be run by sort of more vanilla but still elite theater special operations forces. Generally, uh, we're talking about Army Green Berets. And it's forces like this, uh, commandos, uh, that are, you know, increasingly running operations uh, across Africa. Uh, and in these uh, 127 ECHO programs, what they do is they develop a, uh, a small local force of about 80 to 100 and sol uh, 120 soldiers, indigenous troops. They're specially selected. They go through uh, extensive training. They're outfitted with the same equipment as U.S. special operators, and they go after uh, assigned counterterrorism targets, especially high-value targets. But uh, what makes these programs so unique is that uh, these local troops are not fighting for their own country's policy aims. They work strictly at the behest of the U.S. military, so there are proxy forces, surrogates, who conduct America's wars abroad, uh, you know, on on behalf of the American people. Uh, again, in, in East Africa, in, uh, in Somalia, it's Navy SEALs, elsewhere, Army Green Berets, Army Rangers, and Marine Corps Raiders. And uh, it's, it's these special ops forces that have been uh, a key area of expansion on the continent in recent years. In 2006, about 1% of all U.S. commandos who were deployed overseas uh, were deployed in Africa. In 2010, it had inched up to just about 3%. But by 2017, uh, that number reached nearly 17%, meaning that uh, more commandos were sent to Africa than anywhere in the world outside of the Middle East. And you know, what really uh, drove home to me just how extensive and how expansive uh, US special operations missions in Africa were was speaking with uh, retired general Donald Bolduck. Right now, as you can see on the right there, Don is running for Senate uh, for the great state of New Hampshire. But uh, before that, he served at U.S. Africa Command from 2013 to 2015. And then he headed up uh, Special Operations Command Africa until 2017. So he was, uh, in effect, the chief of U.S. commandos on the African continent for 
uh, for two years. And he oversaw uh, this uh, very large increase in commando missions. And what General Bolduc uh, explained to me was that when he left his command in 2017, he and his commandos were carrying out 96 missions and 886 tasks in 28 different countries. I just want to take a moment to say that again. Uh, 96 missions, 886 tasks, 28 countries. Obviously, that's a lot of activity in a lot of places. And I, I think the places are, are uh, especially important to talk about, um, you know, where these troops are operating from. Uh, it's, it's another integral and it's uh, a largely uh, unknown facet of the story. You know, for the, for the last 10 years, AFRICOM has not only sought to define its presence on the continent as limited in scope, uh, but it's pushed the fiction that uh, U.S. outposts on the continent are small, that they're temporary, and, uh, and little more than uh, local bases where Americans are tenants. You know, in fact, AFRICOM, uh, it denies having bases on the continent, uh, save for one, which is a former French Foreign Legion base in the, uh, the sun-bleached nation of Djibouti, in the Horn of Africa. But it's simply not the case. A document that I was able to lay my hands on, uh, it's a 2018 briefing by AFRICOM's science advisor. It shows uh, the military's constellation of bases includes 34 sites that are scattered across the continent with, uh, with high concentrations of them in, uh, in the north and west as well as the Horn of Africa. But I think you can probably see them a little better on, on this side. Uh, that was the actual one and this was a rendering that was uh, an illustration for an article on the subject that I co-wrote for Yahoo News. So, you know, AFRICOM's uh, network of bases includes uh, what they call uh, enduring outposts, which consist of forward operating sites and cooperative security locations, which they call CSLs, uh, as well as uh, more numerous austere sites uh, known as contingency locations. Now, the, uh, the, the briefing that I was able to get my hands on confirms that the U.S. military currently has more sites, uh, five in Niger, including, or more sites in, in West Africa, uh, in Niger, which include uh, two cooperative security locations. That's, uh, that's more than any other uh, country on the, the western side of the continent. And uh, I don't want to run through all those bases, but I did want to mention one especially key facility, and that's a drone base located at uh, uh, Nigerian Air Base 201 in Agadez. Now, Air Base 201 is officially classified as a, uh, a cooperative security location, and officially a CSL is neither a U.S. facility nor a base. But the sheer dimensions, the cost, and the importance of Agadez uh, seem to suggest otherwise. My reporting disclosed that uh, Agadez not only boasts a $100 million plus construction price tag, but uh, also the estimated cost to U.S. Uh, taxpayers is going to be more than a quarter billion dollars by 2024 when the 10-year agreement for its use ends. So we're talking about a great deal of construction, uh, as you can see in the, the change there, a great deal of money, and, uh, and a fairly unconvincing argument that, uh, that this is actually not a base. Now, Agadez is uh, an especially important location uh, because it allows the U.S. to have what the military calls persistent ISR, that is, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities over uh, not only Niger, but also large swaths of Chad, Nigeria, and especially Libya. Or rather, they'll have persistent ISR if they ever get the base fully operational. Uh, construction of the base began in the summer of 2016, and the U.S. military hoped that they would be flying drones out of the base by the end of that year, but uh, they weren't. And now the military says that drones will be f uh, finally flying out of the base at the end of the year, and we'll have to see if, uh, if that really happens. 
Instead, a base north of here uh, has been picking up the slack. It's known as Durku. Uh, it was, uh, began operation as a US military base. I believe now it's uh, shifted to, uh, to CIA control. And right now, I'm trying to run down that story. But uh, that's what it looks like right now. Now, uh, you know, there's no question that, uh, that the US wants to have more ISR coverage in Africa. And uh, in the time since construction of this base, Agadez began, uh, US military operations in the, uh, the north and the west of uh, the continent have uh, dramatically increased. Since 2016, uh, the US has carried out hundreds of drone strikes uh, targeting Al-Qaeda and uh, Islamic State militants in Libya, including a, a spate of strikes that took place right at the end of September. Uh, they were supposedly on ISIS targets. There hasn't been uh, a lot of reporting on, the, on that yet. It's a very difficult area to get to. But uh, despite those Libya strikes, in the last two years, most US strikes in Africa have taken place on the other side of the continent, uh, in Somalia. And these strikes have increased uh, greatly of late. Uh, there were, for example, uh, 14 strikes in Somalia under President uh, Barack Obama in 2016. But last year, under the Trump administration, they jumped to 47. Uh, this year, there have already been uh, 55 either declared or claimed US strikes, according to the, uh, the monitoring group. Uh, air wars, so it's been a really significant jump of late. Now, questions have long uh, swirled ar in, around these attacks and who exactly is, is dying in U.S. airstrikes. On April 1st, uh, 2018, the U.S. military carried out an airstrike near El Burr, which is a town in central Somalia. A press release issued uh, by U.S. Africa Command a day later announced that the attack had killed five uh, quote-unquote terrorists. But in reality, these terrorists included a civilian woman and a child. Uh, AFRICOM, however, told uh, the world a different story. Uh, quote was, we assess no civilians were killed in this airstrike. Uh, that's what uh, the press release read. And it took an entire year before AFRICOM uh, publicly admitted that a civilian woman and a child had been killed. In the aftermath of that strike, I gave a call to the uh, chief spokesman, and he told me at that time, quote, this is our first confirmed civilian casualty incident in Somalia. So what that means was that uh, AFRICOM contends that uh, after hundreds of airstrikes and hundreds of commando missions over the past 10 years, they've killed or injured two civilians. You know, I just wanted to, uh, to repeat that again. You know, 10 years, you know, it's a decade of ground and air operations, and they're claiming two civilian dead. Now, this flies in the face of uh, scores of, of local accounts, as well as uh, investigations by international journalists and uh, human rights organizations. Uh, New America, which is a Washington, D.C.-based think tank, uh, has counted up, uh, they concluded as many as 53 civilians have been killed in U.S. attacks in Somalia since 2003. The London-based uh, Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, puts the toll at as many as 58 killed. But most experts that I've talked to believe that these numbers are extremely low estimates. The, uh, the most troubling study that I've seen of late uh, was one that Amnesty International put out uh, earlier this year. They did an extremely rigorous investigation of just five strikes out of more than 80 that were conducted between April 2017 and December 2018. And they found uh, credible evidence that 14 civilians, uh, including children, were killed. And that's just in the five strikes of the, of the 80 during that time frame. You know, so it, it really begs the question um, you know, of, of exactly Who's being killed in these strikes? Um, you might ask yourself that question. Uh, you might ask why uh, so many more of these strikes are being carried out. And you know, one of the reasons that uh, experts have told me is that uh, 
the introduction of relaxed targeting standards. In March 2017, uh, President Trump reportedly designated uh, parts of Somalia as uh, what they call areas of active hostilities. And that means that uh, Obama-era rules that required that there'd be a near certainty that non-combatants uh, would not be killed or injured were uh, abandoned. Now, I've gone to the White House many times to try and get clarification on this, and, uh, and they won't answer the question. They won't tell me what the standard operating procedures are for U.S. forces. They won't say, uh, you know, what, uh, what rules of engagement troops are operating under. So I again went to General Bolduc because uh, he was there at the time of the changeover. He worked uh, during the first uh, six months of the Trump administration. And, uh, you know, I asked him, you know, exactly what was going on. And he was very candid about it. Uh, you know, he explained that the burden of proof as to uh, who could be targeted and for what reason changed dramatically once President Trump took office. Uh, he said that change led uh, AFRICOM to conduct airstrikes that previously uh, would never have been carried out. Now, according to General Bolduc, uh, all military-aged males are considered legitimate targets if they're observed with uh, a suspected, and I want to underline that, suspected Al-Shabaab members uh, in locations that the U.S. classifies as supportive of the terror group. You know, I might add that, uh, that General Bolduc says that this is uh, completely counterproductive. Uh, as he put it to me, airstrikes don't affect ideology and uh, they may end up breeding greater instability. Uh, one of the most poignant things he said to me is, uh, uh, quote, you just can't go in there and kill everything that moves. Now, General Bolduc told me that, uh, that he didn't have anything against what he calls HVT hunting, or high value target hunting. But uh, he was adamant about this next point, and again, I'm going to quote him. Uh, we can't continue to destroy everything in our path in the process of trying to secure U.S. national objectives, because at the end of the day, we've done nothing uh, to change the fundamental security and stability of the environment. And I think that this is, uh, it's really especially key, and it leads me to uh, a last set of points that, uh, that I'd like to make before I wrap up. Now, we know that all of this uh, high-value target hunting, and uh, it's done in the service of counterterrorism. And this is AFRICOM's mission statement. You know, they say that they, uh, quote, uh, AFRICOM disrupts and neutralizes transnational threats uh, in order to, quote, uh, promote regional security, stability, and prosperity. But, you know, since AFRICOM began its operations in 2008, uh, the key indicators of security and stability in Africa have plummeted. And, uh, and this isn't according to, uh, human rights groups or, uh, you know, a lefty NGO or anything like that. This is according to uh, the Defense Department's Africa Center for Strategic Studies. So this is the, uh, the Pentagon's own research institution, which is devoted to the study of Africa. And what they found in, uh, in their study earlier this year is that, uh, quote, uh, overall militant Islamist group activity in Africa has doubled since 2012. You know, there are now uh, roughly 24 active militant Islamist groups uh, operating on the continent, and that's up from just five in 2010. Today, 13 African countries uh, face attacks from these groups. That's a 160% increase since 2010. So, you know, while correlation doesn't equal causation, and, uh, and while a variety of factors have, uh, have likely contributed to the rise in violence, uh, some experts say that uh, the overlap between the command's existence and the growing unrest in Africa is not a coincidence. Uh, at the very least, we can see that uh, the metrics are, are heading in the wrong direction. Now, 
just to bring this talk full circle, I wanted to take us back to, the, uh, to West Africa, the Sahel region, where operations uh, Juniper Shield and Obsidian Nomad were uh, just two of a number of counterterrorism programs that were being run by the U.S. and where the United States has, uh, has sacrificed uh, now a good deal of blood and quite a bit of treasure uh, in order to stop the spread of uh, violent extremism. Uh, but uh, despite all this outlay, uh, and despite and some analysts might say because of these long-running uh, U.S. military efforts in the region, uh, militant groups in the Sahel have grown more active their attacks uh, are more frequent. Again, that's uh, according to the Africa Center. And uh, violent episodes uh, that are linked to groups associated with Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and uh, ISIS in the Greater Sahara, which is the group that killed the four American servicemen in Niger, increased from 192 uh, in 2017 to 464 last year. So we're talking about an extremely large jump in, in just one year. At the same time, uh, fatalities linked to these groups more than doubled from 529 to 1,112. And the, uh, the last fact that I, I wanted to leave you with is the increase of what uh, the Africa Center calls violent events across the continent. And that's since AFRICOM uh, began its operations. And it might be the most uh, dismal number of all, and the worst one for uh, people all across uh, the African continent. So you know, the number of violent events was something that AFRICOM was uh, supposed to help control. But it went from 288 in 2009 to 3,050 in uh, 2018. So that was an increase of 960% uh, over the course of a decade. And that was a number that I found shocking, and, uh, and that's where I'm going to leave it. And I want to thank you for your time and your attention, and uh, I really look forward to your questions during the Q&A and continuing this discussion. So uh, thank you very much. So we have two microphones uh, on both sides of the room. And uh, while we wait for people to screw up their courage and think of clever questions, um, I don't know, can I just ask, how do you name an operation in Africa? Are these the same people who name colors at Sherwin-Williams or something <laughs> like that? Those are amazing names. Yeah. You know, it's something that I've, I've tried to plumb the depths of for years because I'm, I've always been just interested in those names. There's actually, uh, at one time they were chosen by actual humans, but now I'm told there's a system called NICA. Uh, that's the acronym, and I'm afraid I, I don't remember what it stands for. But it pairs up, uh, you know, various, there's various names in the system and it pairs them together. I've been told that sometimes it comes up with things that sound so outlandish or so nefarious that they, they chuck they those names, them. yeah. Uh, it's good to know there's yeah. some standards. Or sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes there's an unfortunate acronym when it's been more than one name. Oh, um, like Operation Iraqi Liberation? That's the one. Oil. Go figure. So, you can't have that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. We have a questioner. Great. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, I am actually a graduate student here at the Jackson School in the Russian, East European, and Central Asian Studies program. Uh, we know that the Kremlin is seeking to increase uh, their influence in Africa, uh, most notably in the Central African Republic, but in other areas where um, AFRICOM also has a presence. Right. So can you speak to how um, AFRICOM's presence or influence might be changing in view of what the Kremlin is seeking to do? Sure. No, I, uh, I actually wrote an article on this a few months ago. I wish I could, I wish I could remember everything that I had in there, but uh, you know, what I, I do remember well about it, and it was the basis of the article, is I was able to get a hold of um, 
they were sort of back-channel communications between the current head of AFRICOM and the former head who just left his post uh, several months ago. And both of them, uh, they were explicit when they, they spoke publicly before Congress, but uh, even behind the scenes, they were even uh, more explicit in their fears. Uh, they talked a great deal about uh, a private military contracting firm called the Wagner Group that they believe is uh, you know, a front for uh, shuttling Russian forces uh, into Africa, uh, specifically Central African Republic, but elsewhere. Uh, you know, they, they believe that, uh, that uh, Russia had designs on, uh, on countering U.S. influence and even uh, building bases in Africa. Now, they didn't, they didn't seem to have any evidence of this, and I haven't seen uh, you know, any evidence that the, the, the Russian footprint is going to be any kind of mirror of the U.S. one, but uh, it's certainly a fear uh, among the AFRICOM commanders. Uh, they worry about Russia in the near term, and in the longer term, they're actually, I think, more worried about China, and China um, you know, also building bases across the continent. And they even suggested maybe some interplay between Russia and China. Again, there seemed to be no basis for this at all, but uh, I think they wanted to throw that out there because uh, there has been a shift in the last uh, year or two under the Trump administration to uh, move away from counterterrorism in some ways and focus on what they consider <laughs> near-peer competitors. Uh, so it's, it's China and Africa are seen as, seen as, the, uh, as, as those near-peers. And uh, you know, for AFRICOM to continue to get its piece of the funding pie, you do need to say that uh, you're going to conduct uh, operations to counter those competitors on the continent. So I think that does play a role. All right. Uh, we now have three people at the microphones. And uh, let me go over here. I think you were next. Yeah. And why uh, don't you say your name and where you're from? Sure. Uh, my name's Harmon. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Pathology. This is more of just like a logistical question. Earlier, you showed a satellite photo of Base 201. Sure. And I know that sometimes uh, with satellite imagery, it can be difficult to get photographs of things like military bases. Yeah. Did you have any problems trying to get a photo of this? I know the US probably denies this even exists, but <laughs> I don't know, just, just a random question. Yeah, no, um, a few years ago, actually, it was, it was much more, or maybe it's going on, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe closer to eight, 10 years ago. It was very tough, uh, you know, with satellite imagery, a lot of times it would be blurred out at the uh, US government's behest, so you would I'd get a tip on a place. Um, Actually, well, sometimes it made it easier to figure out exactly where it was because you'd, you'd have a general location, you'd look for a big blur, and then, uh, then you'd know, oh, this must be the U.S. base. But I, I think they, they found that uh, you know, the, the tech companies that were making the, the commercial satellite imagery available uh, weren't interested in, in playing ball anymore, and there were just so many places to go online to get very good satellite imagery that uh, they've given up on that. So uh, you can find these bases uh, in various ways. Either you can get tips on it. Um, you know, a couple years ago I did a story. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't discover this, but it was um, you know, a, a researcher out there brought this to the attention of Twitter and just put it up online uh, that um, you could use fitness trackers that the US troops uh, use overseas commercial fitness trackers and you would you would find a spot in the middle of some out of the way desert you know and and there'd be a spot where you could see it be white hot from uh, from running around the perimeter of a base uh, you could see the exact contours of the base because of it and then match it up with, uh, with the satellite imagery and see exactly where they were or you'd have a pretty good idea of that was the US military or at least another Western military in the region. So yeah, there are ways to do this, but it's, uh, it's actually become easier as time's gone on. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank sure. You. All right. Um, you might have, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Ron Bowie. I'm uh, MPH Health Services and PhD uh, Health Informatics. Okay, right. Um, you might have touched on this um, a bit earlier with um, 
when you mentioned China. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious, like, where over the last several years, China's been doing a lot of development projects and um, kind of service and work there, like NGO type work, to essentially, I think, build good faith as well as economic ties with African countries. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak any more to how that intersects with the U.S. engagement in the continent. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, China's influence on the continent is it's widespread. I mean, it's everywhere. Everywhere I travel, there are, there's always a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, it's, it's generally economic engagement. It's a lot of large-scale con construction projects. New uh, roads. New roads, uh, big government buildings, stadiums. Uh, these, these Chinese projects are, are generally, I mean, they're, they're massive at scale, and it, it drives home. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this in, in Uganda, where you've uh, spent time. I mean, And they're not gifts, no, to be clear. No, they, they come with, uh, with strings. These are loans. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, China's really made a name for itself around the continent because they're willing to, they're willing to come in and engage. Now, Sometimes they rub people the wrong way because they bring in a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of Chinese workers that come in and, uh, you know, a lot of countries want, uh, you know, their, their own people to, of course, have, uh, get those jobs. But, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese projects are, are big and, and showy and, you know, the fact that they're willing to engage and be on the ground, uh, you know, it, it's seen as a, as a major plus and, the United States has tried to compete on this level, but, uh, but has largely failed in it. So while the United States is running around the continent doing counterterrorism whack-a-mole, the, uh, the Chinese are having this uh, economic engagement. It, it got so bad a couple of years ago, or maybe good, depending on how you see it, but uh, the United States uh, you know, was trying to, to pump money into to African construction and uh, you know, to compete with China on some level. And they had something called the uh, Millennium Development Fund. And they went to Mali and said that they were gonna build a, a major government building. And they tried to get a US company to come over and do the building. And there were no US firms that wanted to do it. So they looked around, tried to find a construction firm that would, and they found one. And it was a Chinese construction company that was uh, state-sponsored. So it was American tax dollars being shuttled into Chinese state-run company to build a project in Africa that was supposed to be a U.S. showpiece, but instead people thought it was a Chinese project because that's who they saw actually building it. So, you know, the U.S. is, I think, uh, they've tried to compete, but, I've, you know, uh, that's one egregious example, but, uh, but it shows they've shot themselves in the foot, and it's been more than once. Thank you. Sure. James. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, James Pfeiffer at the Department of Global Health here at UW. And just want to thank you for a great talk and thank you for thank you. the work that you do, which I think is, seems extremely difficult and um, I imagine it quite dangerous and it is of hugely important value to us. So thank, thank you. you for doing all this work and please, thank please you. keep it up because no one else is doing it. I have two uh, really quick questions. One is, um, you know, the title of your talk is The, the Secret Wars in Africa, and, and, and why do you think they're secret? Why keep them secret? Uh, and secondly, perhaps related to this, it seems like the argument you're making is that there's a, it looks like the increased military presence, rather than creating peace and prosperity, which is what us taxpayers think is happening with our money, that in fact it's created instability. And I'm wondering if if that's the case, what is it about the American presence um, that creates that instability? Why is that happening? Okay, sorry, I'm just, uh, I just wanna make sure I get both of those and I'm apt to forget. Now, why they're kept secret? Um, it's a very good question. I think uh, on the one hand, this is a default position for the US military. <laughs> I mean, they tend to keep secret almost anything they can Often it, it's, it's difficult to understand exactly why. Uh, but uh, you know, when I've, I've talked to uh, you know, higher ranking uh, commanders about this, generally what's talked about is uh, they frame it as local sensitivities. Uh, you usually hear some sort of murmur about uh, the legacy of colonialism. 
And generally, I, I think it is to, uh, to try and shield it from you know, local populations, the, the public in these countries, that they don't want to be seen as having a large footprint, that it could be seen as uh, you know, an invasion or occupation or s some sort of neo-colonial uh, uh, project. So I think that's, that's most of what it is. Uh, they talk a lot about operational security. Uh, you know, I think there are, uh, you know, sometimes there, there are s legitimate sensitivities there that, uh, you, know, you know, if I received information that I thought could uh, put lives at risk, if AFRICOM explained this to me, uh, you know, it's certainly something that, that I, would, uh, I wouldn't take lightly and I would uh, discuss with my editors. But, you know, these bases, uh, one, you can find them online. Uh, on your own if you're interested in that, and the you know, local populations know about them. The people in the area, you know, they're, they're not unaware of the, the base at Agadez. You know, when the Americans uh, come to town, I mean, generally everybody in that area knows about it. So the word spreads. Uh, so keeping bases secret, you know, I've never quite understood it when they said, when they, they claim operational security, but that's what they, they talk about. Now, why the instability? Again, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, uh, you know, that uh, it's, it's unclear whether it's actual causation here. But again, the, the metrics all seem to head in the wrong way. Uh, you know, I, I think maybe it's easier to talk about it and to, to give an example. It's kind of a, a long, circuitous one, but I think it might help to explain it. Uh, because there, there are often these knock-on effects that I think the United States uh, doesn't fully appreciate. Uh, and it's, it's often difficult to see far down the road. But uh, and I think at some point you have to uh, understand that you, you do such a poor job of it that, that maybe you need to consider it more. Now, when the, the U.S. intervened in, in Libya in 2011, uh, you know, it, was, it was treated as an as a easy win. I mean, that uh, it was a, a U.S. air war backing uh, local forces on the ground, the revolutionaries there. Uh, you know, uh, as uh, Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State at the time, put it, uh, we came, he saw, uh, we saw, he died, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, and it was, it was seen as uh, an unmitigated success right at the beginning. But it plunged Libya into, uh, you know, a state of, of civil unrest. Uh, and you know, currently in a state of civil war. Uh, ever since then, there's been a proliferation of, uh, of armed groups, uh, militias, uh, Islamist militant groups that have taken hold there. The government in Tripoli, the UN-backed government there is, uh, I mean, it's extremely rickety. It doesn't even have its own army. I mean, when I was there earlier this year uh, covering the, the civil war, you know, you, you drive to the front lines and you have to go through one checkpoint after another, and each checkpoint, it's a different militia that's heading that checkpoint, because that's who the national army is. So the, the country has been fractured. Uh, it's never been able to put itself back together. And I mean, it wasn't just Libya that was affected, because uh, you know, Gaddafi had uh, these Tuareg fighters who worked for him. And as his regime was collapsing, the Tuaregs, uh, they looted his weapons stores and they took them back to their native uh, Mali. And they started to take over the north of the country. Now, the Malian government, which we had been building up for years as a, a counterterrorism bulwark in, in West Africa, uh, was doing a, a horrendous job fighting them and was beginning to collapse. And there was a, uh, a captain in the Malian military who thought that he could do a better job than his government. And he overthrew that government with a, a junta of other officers. Now that uh, captain, uh, Amadou Sinogo, he received uh, his training at uh, various uh, army bases in the United States in, I believe, Arizona, Georgia, uh, or now about, uh, I think there were six bases in the US where he had spent time. And he actually said that, uh, you know, he credited the, uh, 
what he learned in the U.S. With, uh, with making his coup successful. He said he learned a lot from the United States. They had a fantastic army, and he put it to use. Uh, he did. He was able to overthrow his own government, but he was, uh, he was no more effective in fighting uh, the Tuaregs uh, than the government had been, actually in a lot of ways less effective. Uh, and at the same time, because of this ineffectiveness of, of his government, uh, a bunch of Islamist groups from around the region, uh, they came out of uh, Libya, they came out of uh, Nigeria, there were some Boko Haram militants that uh, went in there, Ansar al-Din, a number of forces, they pushed the Tuaregs out and then they made a push for the capital. Uh, they would have taken Mali if the French didn't come in and intervene. The French and some allied African forces came in. They stopped the advance, uh, but ever since then, this was in 2011, 2012, uh, there's been a persistent insurgency. Mali's never recovered from that. Uh, some of those weapons that were in Mali and were in the Touareg's hands have spread across the continent uh, as far east as Egypt. They've also spread off the continent. Some of them have showed up, uh, everything from small arms to, uh, to uh, shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles uh, in Syria. So, you know, it's, it's these effects that I think, you know, breed instability. It's the fact that uh, just not able to game out exactly you know, where, where one military intervention will end up taking us. And I think, uh, I think it's things like that, that that end up. So I think I took 20 minutes answering your question, but I, I hope it helped. Great, thank you. Can I just chime in on that yeah. a bit? Um, of course, there are so many indirect health effects of war, and one of them is that when countries become destabilized, they tend to lose their health workforce. If there are physicians trained in that country, they become yeah. mobile and are able to leave. And after the U.S. debacle in Libya, many, many of their physicians moved to South Africa. Mm -hmm. So you can trace these migration patterns of uh, physicians around the world to map the conflicts. Uh, over here, tell us your name. Yeah, hi. thank you very much. My name's Carol, and uh, I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Kenya. Okay. Okay, this is extremely depressing. Extremely. Sorry. Uh, just a couple of quick questions, if you wouldn't mind. What does the U.S. government offer these governments to put our troops in? I mean, we're going to do something or bring, you know, whatever. Um, sure. Second, I noticed the Seychelles has mm. a base. You had it on your map. Yes. Which surprised me. I'm, I knew about the, the naval base in Kenya. It's been there for 40 years. But the Seychelles is a communist country, and how did we get in there? They don't belong there. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's, it's in recent years, um, and the U.S. was flying drone missions out of the Seychelles. Uh, there were surveillance drones, um, maybe for a short time armed drones. I think actually they've stopped the uh, drone operations there, but they're still keeping uh, the base open for some reason. I'm not exactly sure what's happening there. It might be signals intelligence. Uh, that could be something that they're, uh, there might be, they might be running ships, uh, you know, sort of in that corridor off the coast. But it was still active as of uh, last year. and. You know, it, that I could verify, and I'm told that it's, it's still in operation, but uh, the drone flights are not flying out of there right now. Now, the first, first part of the question, sorry, was... Well, what is the U.S. government? Oh, what do they give in, in exchange? For these countries? Yeah, uh, I mean, a lot of times it's, it's money. Um, you know, the base at Agadez is leased. Their big base in Djibouti, Camp Lemonnier, it's also leased, and... You know, I think it's the largest source of revenue for the Djiboutian government. Uh, the United States, I can't remember the, the number, but every time they've re-upped the lease, they've increased the, the amount by tens of millions of dollars. This last lease might be $56 million over five years or something like that, or $86 million. It was It was a large chunk of money. Uh, so they, they offer that, and then... You know, they, they provide Djibouti with, uh, with training for their armed forces. I mean, this is one of the things that they, they generally offer. And then they do conduct uh, humanitarian efforts that generally those things they want publicized. So they will go out and conduct a, a, what they call a med cap or a vet cap where they do, uh, 
you know, they, they do some sort of small scale medical interventions in the countryside and they do dig boreholes or wells and, you know, this is, this is try to, to try to show the, the softer side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, tell us your name. Hi, my name is Richard. I'm an aeronautical engineer. Uh, so I wanted to present an idea to you that hasn't been talked about. I think it's perhaps like underlying one of the biggest issues. Uh, demographics, developing world, sure. uh, where most people are under the age of 30. Exactly. And there's an expectation of economic development, inclusion, jobs. So this kind of whack-a-mole thing that you're talking about, or the Chinese Belt and Road, or the Russians coming in and all that stuff, I, I think it's kind of like flies over the carcass that really is the big problem. What, what do you think? Well, you're right, and this is something that it's always brought up. It, it, it may be often the first thing that's brought up in public testimony when uh, AFRICOM goes to Congress. They always talk about the youth bulge. They always talk about the fact that, uh, that you know, Af Africa is the, you know, they, they usually use a phrase like the continent of the future, things like that. that uh, but <laughs> a, a lot of times it's, it's then framed uh, on the lines of, um, you know, that it, that it means there's likely unrest or, or instability because of, of that youth. And, um, you know, that there's always, uh, there's, there's usually a mention of some sort that, uh, you know, will there be enough jobs for all these people, uh, young men? And uh, if there aren't, what's that going to mean? And the implication is more instability. And if that is, it's definitely a frame that uh, the AFRICOM uses to look at the continent. And I think it's, it's one that they try to impress upon Congress every year. They, they use that, uh, the, the young age of the, the, the population and the extreme growth of the population to emphasize the, the need for more resources to the continent. All right, your turn. Oh, well, you answered. Tell us uh, who you are. Can everybody hear me? No, we need to record it for the radio. Oh, we need to record it for the radio. Okay, uh, you actually answered a, a good chunk of my question, but I want to put it into a, a, a little broader context. And isn't it possible that the increase in violence incidents uh, that you had on your graph earlier was actually possibly more due to the fact that the ideology that we're actually trying to deal with uh, using uh, military means is actually spread across the en entire northern part of Africa and through the Middle East and all the way over into the Philippines, as, as well as passing through India and Pakistan and Afghanistan, and that the uprooting of the caliphate in uh, ISIS caliphate in Syria and Iraq moved thousands and thousands of fighters through this fluent ideology uh, through North Africa into an abundance of arms that were readily available to them as you presented in your Libya example and, and that our response, our base is actually a response to this uprooting and this increasing of threat and increasing of violence and political upheaval in these countries, and that we are there not only because it brings money, uh, but we're also there because the government asked us to come there because they couldn't hold on, they couldn't actually defend themselves from these uh, Turaks? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good point, and uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. Of course, um, you know, ISIS now, I believe that the U.S. government counts six ISIS franchises uh, in Africa. So it's, uh, it's a, you know, a, a growing concern uh, on the continent, even though the, the fiscal caliphate in the, the Middle East is, is gone. And uh, of course, you know, this is, it goes back to this idea of uh, follow-on effects. I mean, ISIS was, uh, you know, was birthed in a U.S. prison camp in Iraq. I mean, this is where the leaders got together, and that's where it took its, its formation. And yeah, it's been, um, I mean, it's, it's a seductive ideology for, uh, for a lot of people, and it's, it's spread well throughout the region. And, you know, I always think back, uh, you know, before 9-11, before when the U.S. Uh, 
military looked out onto the African continent. Uh, the Army, I think it was the Army War College, did a study. They looked and they could not find one transnational group on the, on the continent, uh, t transnational terror group. They talked about, uh, you know, warlord armies and militias, but, uh, but there was no mention even of any Islamist terrorist groups that they thought were a threat. And then just after 9-11, a uh, Pentagon official carried out a briefing and said the U.S. military would be heading into Africa in a big way because they said there were ungoverned spaces and, you know, once we flush terrorists out of Afghanistan, Africa's someplace they could go. But uh, he was put on the spot and they asked, well, are there any transnational terror groups? And, you know, he fumbled around with the question for a while and the best that he could come up with was that, uh, that bin Laden had offered a salute to uh, Somalis who had carried out the, the Black Hawk Down uh, incident. And so th there wasn't any, any group like that that was active on the continent at the time. But fast forward now, I mean, I gave the, uh, the numbers for Islamist groups from the, the Pentagon Center, but uh, General Bolduc, who I had up there, when I talked to him about it, he said that, uh, that what they count right now is 50 transnational terror groups on the continent. That was um, in 2017, and now there's been even more ISIS affiliates that they've added to this list. So, yeah, I mean, there's Arguably been a... Arguably all bred from the Iraq invasion. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where they've come out of, and this, this ideology has been spread. I mean, it was spread by... It, it began in, a, in the cauldron of a U.S. war, and it's been spread throughout uh, yeah. U.S. military activity. Thank you. All right, Ali, tell us your name. Thanks. Uh, my name is Ali. Uh, I'm a physician, and uh, I just also graduated from uh, UW last uh, uh, summer. So, um, with an MPH in public health. I will not ask my question uh, for the health impact, because you already touched a little bit on that. Um, it is known that Africa is a poor con a continent, um, sometimes a, a poor country. Um, <laughs> yes. So, but I also know that there is no, um, what is the economic side of this war? Uh, because uh, it's said by s some people who have uh, written before us that there is always an economic side to any war, or if it's not in Africa, where is it? Hmm. And what is that? Um, I will couple that idea with, I am been, I've been following the uh, Democrats' uh, debate uh, on, uh, on the future, because you alluded that Africa is the continent of the future. <laughs> uh, how about the present and the past? <laughs> exactly. Um, but my point here is to say this. Um, I know, I understand we are talking about climate change and um, all those things about what um, will be the new way of living in the future. Is there any correlation or any link to that with the war that uh, uh, has been secret to American and not secret to the African people? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> those are uh, there's some difficult questions. Uh, you know, I'll start with the climate change one because um, actually in those same answers that I mentioned that I'd, I'd gotten the back channel communications between Congress and the AFRICOM commanders, in those there was also quite a bit of mention about uh, climate change. And this is something that, uh, that it, it was apparent that AFRICOM is thinking a lot about. Uh, I think they think of it in, the, in terms of, of resource wars, that this is, uh, you know, that, that they see coming conflict on the continent, uh, coming from a scarcity of resources, water, food, and that this is going to be a, a, a driver of instability, and, you know, they're the ones to counter it. Uh, so I think that's the lens that they see, you know, the climate change through, that this is, uh, it's either a growth opportunity for AFRICOM, 
uh, from more militarization or that it's, uh, it's, it's going to destabilize the continent in, in significant ways. Um, you know, and again, some of this is tied to, to funding. I think they're trying to make the case that, uh, that they need more assets on the continent, that they need more money to the continent, they need a bigger presence on the continent because of this, this coming upheaval. Uh, and I guess that touches in, in some ways on the first part of your question about um, the economics of this. And I have to, uh, have to say I'm, I've never looked into it in depth. Uh, you know, there's certainly, there's certainly a lot of money that flows in when you have a, a large U.S. presence. Um, you know, some of it gets the, the local economy. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there aren't uh, U.S. construction firms that want to work on the continent. Generally, the money for U.S. construction of, of bases goes to, in the last couple of years, I've seen Turkish firms that seem to be willing to uh, take on that role. And they must be coming with a low bid because uh, they're doing the building right now. Um, you know, but I, I don't know that I, I have uh, a lot more on the, the economics of it. I know that AFRICOM has tried to, uh, they, they run some of these humanitarian efforts that I've, I've talked about briefly. Uh, and those efforts often are, they try and pump a little money into the local community uh, through them. But, you know, the a piece that I wrote on that years ago found that they, they were ineffective at, uh, at tracking where the money actually went, and they didn't have any good metrics on, uh, on uh, whether the projects were successful. In fact, they, they had never uh, come up with uh, you know, any kind of indicators of what success would look like. So when uh, the Government Accountability Office looked at it, you know, it was, it was these, just a spreadsheet with, with some dollar amounts and nothing added up. And, uh, some no of the money, of right? Some of the money went to the community, but uh, they didn't know where, or maybe it didn't. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, let's take a couple more questions here, and here, and here. So, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Noah. I'm an undergraduate student in the Jackson School of International Studies and the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, and my question is along the lines of. U.S. foreign policy trends. So we've seen from containment to post-Soviet enlargement. Um, I'm asking about the trend nowadays as we're seeing towards more isolationist as we had pre-1945. So I'm wondering if you can speak to the role of the United States in secret wars like this, in intervention, um, the relevance of this secret war presentation to our uh, situation in Syria and Turkey at the moment, um, and to our political movement towards isolationism as we see it with presidential candidates and other people saying we got to not be kingmakers, we got to pull out. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to that in terms of those ungoverned spaces as the Pentagon put it so long ago. Okay. Oh. I don't know. I think a lot of these questions are above my pay grade, but uh, I'll take a shot at what I can. So uh, you're asking about the now, what I scrolled down here was the, the role of, of the U.S. in, uh, in secret wars and how that... Uh, Isolationism. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the shift under the, the Trump administration was, was supposed to be, you know, when they, when they came out with the new uh, national security strategy, the idea was that uh, you need to pull back from these... Um, you know, from these uh, counterterrorism wars, uh, and you know, of course, uh, the, the president has talked about ending wars and bringing troops home in sort of an amorphous way. And uh, the, the greater focus under the national security strategy is, is supposed to be, again, on these near peer competitors, on Russia and China. Uh, that's great for uh, you know, the, the large scale weapons makers. Um, you know, the, uh, but, you know, I feel like the, the Pentagon has, has slow rolled the president on, on a number of these things a number of times. Uh, you know, he announced a pullout from Syria once before, which never actually happened. We heard about it this time. Uh, you know, first it was supposed to be a complete withdrawal. And then, you know, you started to hear backtracking. And I think it wasn't just that, uh, you know, that there was bipartisan consensus in in Congress that this was a bad idea, that it, it upset the Washington consensus, but you know, the, I don't think the Pentagon wanted to do this, and I think 
they've found ways to, uh, to thwart him. I mean, immediately off the bat, the complete withdrawal did not include a, uh, a base in the south called Al Tomf. That was off limits. And then, you know, the president started talking about having to secure the oil fields. Now, uh, you know, I was, I was giving some talks earlier, so I didn't get to read as much on this, but I saw a couple of reports just now that now they're talking about sending in armored units, tanks, uh, to protect uh, oil fields in Syria. Oil. Right. Yeah. So it really doesn't sound like much of a withdrawal to me when there wasn't armor there and, and now it's going in. Uh, you know, and, and the president said, you know, we're bringing the troops home, but it's only if their homes were in western Iraq because <laughs> that's where, where they're going to be based. And, you know, I think they're probably going to, to beef up, uh, you know, the, the, that base that I mentioned at Al Tamf. It's very small, but there's a big American base in Jordan just across the border so they can provide artillery support if necessary, uh, send in quick reaction forces, and then there's, there's a big force just to secure that garrison. So, I mean... It's going well. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure, but uh, I, I don't know that we're pulling out. Yeah. My name is Lou Rochelle Brim Atkins, and I'm a former administrator here at the university, but now I do some work in West Central Africa. Okay. And my biggest regret is that I didn't take my high blood pressure medicine today. <laughs> um, I'm very sorry. I know, I know. So my question is this, um, how do you see the current involvement of United States and France and China and Russia as any different than the arrogance and greed that we saw during the partition of Africa years ago. Yeah, I've, I've Some people remember that. Yeah, a, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, you know, I, this is another one where I think it's a, above my pay grade. And it's, uh, you know, one thing that I can say is that I've, I've always been distressed by um, you know, some of the, 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 t the talk or the, the language that I see in AFRICOM documents uh, that really seems to harken back to, uh, you know, the, the, the colonial scramble for Africa and the idea that, uh, that the, the continent is, uh, you know, there's, it's a blank space in, in the middle that has to be filled in in some way that uh, when, when AFRICOM often talks about, you know, something that I mentioned in the talk, ISR, uh, you know, they need to have uh, persistent coverage over the continent because of these, it's blank spaces, you know, that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sort of this dark continent motif that they use, uh, that, uh, that we need to surveil Africa because if we don't have eyes on uh, these countries and, and these, uh, these, what they see as dangerous backlands of the planet, that these are the sources of instability. They never, I think, I think there's very little realization, you know, even when they, they look at their own metrics that, you know, they might be the drivers of this, but instead it's that uh, somehow the, the continent itself and the, the people of these countries that, uh, that they are malign actors or the continent is an is a, a unknown and unknowable place and the only way that we can we can know it is to have drones circling overhead. Okay, I'm going to indulge one last speaker because she's my student. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for speaking today. Um, my name is Smriti, up. and um, I have a question with regards to the conversation you just had with Dr. Ali. Um, both of you talked about climate change being used as a justification by AFRICOM, which is a government body, right? Yes. Um, to justify what they're doing, all the actions and activities that are happening. Um, how is AFRICOM able to use climate change as justification when the current administration denies climate change? <laughs> <laughs> no. Don't you love our students? No, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. and. You know, I'd, I'd probably have a better job if I had a, a good answer to that. You know, I think, um, you know, in some ways, the, uh, the, the Pentagon has been the U.S. government institution that's been out in front of, of climate change more than any other. Uh, and they've been the one that's, I think, most reluctant 
to, uh, to be cowed by the Trump administration. Uh, they have seen it. You know, there, there's a lot of reasons why it, it affects what they do. Now, the Pentagon is also, it's the largest uh, you know, uh, non-national emitter of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases. And it ranks above many countries uh, in, in that. Uh, but, uh, but still, I think there is a, a realization there that it's, it's real. There's enough people there. And also, I think they see it as, as a, it's just a, a growth area for them. It's a way to, uh, you know, it might be a way to appeal to Democrats to say, like, this is, there's a, a climate change issue here. Like, you should, you should get on board with that. So it might Thank be a sop in that question. direction. Thank you. Uh, before we close, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that this kind of journalism is really hard to do, and it's not well supported in this country. And as more and more journalism outlets are fading and uh, becoming centralized, it's even harder um, for people like this. Um, my mom is here tonight, and she's a big follower of Tom Englehart's blog, which is where you publish often. Yeah, I still uh, like And uh, Nick also has a website, and I encourage you to figure out how to support these independent voices in journalism. Um, they Thank are you. just so important to our ability to know anything about these secrets. So please engage on these things. And thank you so much oh, for being here. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you all. I really appreciate you coming out tonight.